Hello, I'm Roger Woods with the Walled Lake Church of Christ. I'm so glad you're able to join me today for this time of uh, exploration in God's Word, as well as the opportunity to gather around the Lord's table and partake of His uh, body represented by the bread and His blood represented by the cup. If you are partaking with me today, I encourage you to have your elements ready, and we will be ready to do that right at the end of the sermon. Today, my sermon will be continuing with the series in 2 Peter. Today's topic is growing in self-control. As we get started, let's sing a song that was a favorite of mine, believe it or not, as a kid, probably because I had trouble with this. Uh, the song is called Angry Words. Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lip. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior, children obey the blessed command. Love is much too pure and holy, friendship is too sacred for, for a moment's reckless folly. Thoughts to desolate and mar. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. Angry words are lightly spoken. Bitterest thoughts are rashly stirred. Brightest links of life are broken by a single angry word. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. As I said, this was a childhood favorite. And indeed, I am singing this out of the hymnal from Great Songs of the Church. And it happens to be a copy from the very church that my family attended when I was born, the Groton, Connecticut Church of Christ. A little bit of tidbit there of history. We'll sing another song before we take of the Lord's Supper. In Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25, we read, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. You know, losing control has become a big problem for our society. Sports is just one example. The old saying, I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. Well, unfortunately, that's true, but not just for hockey games anymore. An atmosphere of mob violence seems to be growing in our sporting events. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Sports is just another manifestation of the general rise in violence throughout our community. Even our political figures use language aimed at whipping up furor rather than reasoned, thoughtful discourse and action. Anger is applauded as authentic expression rather than the destructive cancer that it is. Frederick Buchner, in his 1993 book, Wishful Thinking, had this to say about the destructive nature of anger. Of the seven deadly sins, writes Buchner, anger is possibly the most fun. 
to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback, however, is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Anger, anger as we typically practice it, does not make us more godlike. On the contrary, anger does the exact opposite. Remember, it was the crowd whipped up into anger by the Pharisees who chanted, Crucify him! Crucify him! No, anger has little redeeming value. Paul warns us in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 26 and 27, that we must be careful that in your anger you do not sin. Further, he says that we are not to let the sun go down while you are angry, so that the devil may have a foothold. Now, some forms of modern psychiatric theory believe that it's good to vent, to lash out with your raw emotion. It's bad, it seems, to keep your emotions in. If you bottle them up, you're only going to hurt yourself. You only hurt yourself. Well, that's where the problem is, isn't it? If it makes me feel better, that's what I should do. But, you know, that type of venting is nothing to brag about. It only shows our lack of self-control. In Proverbs 29, verse 11, we are told that a fool gives vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Lawrence Peter put it this way, Speak when you're angry, and you'll make the greatest speech you'll ever regret. I know I can add my amen to that last statement from my own personal experience. And when I vented, it didn't really help the situation. Indeed, at best, it made it murkier. It caused more hurt than healing. I'm sure many of you are thinking right now of a time that you lost control and said something hurtful to others. You know what it did to your friends and your relationships. You know what it did to yourself. Out of control anger is like a cloud that blocks us from the love of God and the affections of others as well. Anger is serious business. Jesus in Matthew 5, 21 through 22, likens a person whose life is controlled by anger to a murderer. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Hmm. Jesus likens a murderer to someone who loses control of their anger. But Jesus got mad, didn't he? Yes. But his anger was righteous, and ours is too often not. Jesus was upset because his father's house had been turned into a marketplace that made a mockery of worship to the one true God. The court of the Gentiles uh, was supposed to be a place where they could come and pray, even though they couldn't enter the temple. But instead, it was occupied by a den of thieves. Indeed, we should be angry about sin as Jesus was. But too, all too often, we get angry over matters of opinion while real sin hardly ruffles a feather. I wish we'd be upset today at the way the church has been taken over by modern day thieves dressed as shepherds whose only desire is to fleece the flock. The church is not a tool of politics, commerce, or hate. It is the temple of God in its collective form built by living stones to become a spiritual house where the gospel can be proclaimed and practiced. Where the poor, the rich, the black, the white, the women, the Chinese, the Native Americans, the boys and girls, the men, can all draw together to God through Jesus Christ, his Son. Now this will not happen when we allow anger to control us, or if we allow those controlled by anger and hate to influence us. Church, I urge you to, as I am myself, take time to do a self-examination and do that through the lens of Scripture. 
Ask God through his spirit to convict your heart and purge it of any sin that might be harbored there, especially the sin of anger. And ask for courage. Ask God to give you courage to live for him no matter what the cost. Ask him to lead you to lead your life with love rather than our unperfect, imperfect understandings about what is going on. Unfortunately, God has given us wisdom to know how to avoid sin, including the sin of losing our self-control. How do we avoid being out of control and under the power of sin? and yet still be real people and not robots? Well, James gives us some wise counsel from which I will offer three practical ways you can keep yourself under control. Well, under control, not you under control, but under God's control. James says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word of God implanted in you, which can save you. The first step we need to make is that we need to value others as we do ourselves really even better. Love your neighbor as yourself is the second of the two greatest commandments. If you do not love or value another person, you will not listen to them. I think much of the problem we have with our present political, cultural, and racial conflict is that we have failed to listen to each other, listen to understand. We hold on to our positions with little regard for the experience and feelings of others. Selfishness destroys more relationships than any other vice because it is the gateway to all others. Who consciously says, I deserve a break today. I'll treat myself to a good blow up. And who cares what it does to my kids, my wife, my co-workers? I'll feel better. Who does that? When this attitude rules, well, no one's safe. There may be some who revel in animosity, but they do not stand before God approved. And folks, why would we follow someone like that? But when love is our guiding rule, all people, all those around us will be safe and more they will be blessed. God desires that we be under his control. He wants us to live righteous lives, but to do that, we must first die to ourselves. More than that, crucify ourselves, so that we can live for Christ. Second, we need to set up clear and well-defined boundaries in our life. Notice the word James uses, get rid of all. Now, this is not a halfway proposition here. This is not some, and then a little more. This is all or nothing. Get rid of all moral filth. You know, as Christians, it's easy to look at the hot-button issues like abortion, homosexuality, and feel very self-righteous. But there are equally weighty moral values that we have allowed to degrade without much of a whimper. You know, sexual sin has become almost mainstreamed, yet many Christians silently watch pornography on their phones and tablets and feel pride that they have at least not cheated on their spouse. Yet Jesus tells us that to look lustfully upon another is a sin. And don't forget the hurt endured by many caught up in the sex trade. How our choices impact others' lives is barely thought of. As long as we've got all that we want, we don't give a thought to the suffering of others. That's what selfishness does. And yet this insensitivity impacts everyone around us. It impacts the poor. It, it impacts the oppressed. Not to mention the very earth, which ultimately is ourselves. You know, humans are the only ones that soil their own nests. 
And during this pandemic, our selfish decisions directly affect the health of others. I truly believe that wearing a mask in public around others is an act of love for others, not an impingement of our freedom. We can't be pleasing to God if we are giving in to our base desires. That is a lack of self-control, and it will land us in a place that we do not want to be the wrong side of God's discipline. Finally, James tells us to humbly accept the word planted in you. We need to open ourselves up to God completely. Let him search out all that malice and anger that it may be buried in our lives. And this is important for our own well-being and for those around us. Because if it is still present in our life, it's not removed from our life. It can blow up on us. When I was a child, my dad was in the Navy. And we were stationed in Hawaii. And as you know, uh, Hawaii was attacked by the Japanese during World War II. Well, they tell us out there as kids to always be aware when we were playing in the dirt because there was still unexploded ordnance. And it seemed like quite often there would be a bomb found and tragically sometimes a bomb that went off when someone hit it with a plow or dug it up as a child and was playing with it and it went off. You know, we all have old bombs within us. And if we keep them hidden and we don't let God expose them and remove them, they will explode at the moment of greatest harm to ourselves and to others. But if we accept the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ planted in our hearts, we will be transformed. No longer will we explode with rage, but rather we will turn that emotion into zeal for God. Our inability to control ourselves will have ramifications in this life and in the life to come. But if we allow Jesus to enter our life, we will gain control over sin because we will die to it when we die to ourselves. We are promised in Acts 2 that if we are obedient to God's command, that at baptism we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that Spirit is powerful and will help us with our lack of control. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7 that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. Is your life out of control? Are you losing the battle with sin? Help is yours today in Jesus Christ. Don't hold back from giving yourself to him completely. Don't hold on to anything, especially your anger or other self-destructive habits. Accept the help that can only come from him and change your life today. Begin that process. You do this by acknowledging first your problem with sin. That's the starting place. From there, we must move on in faith to obedience and follow our Lord and Savior. We need to repent and turn away from sin and turn towards God. We need to publicly confess Him as God's Son and our Savior. Then we need to die to ourselves and be born again in Christ. That's what baptism is all about. That's why we die, are buried in water, and raised again, to be raised with Him to newness of life. If you are seeking God and want to complete your faith in Christ, I want to encourage you to come to Him today. We are ready and willing to help you with that. Uh, and if you need that help, please contact us. Because in Christ, you will find the help to be a victor over sin, a victor over death, a victor over, yes, our lack of self-control and especially anger and hate. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we confess to you today that we fall short, that we too often, Lord, give in to our, our desires we lack the control. And Father, for this, we, we pray your forgiveness. For those angry words that we say out of fear, out of hate, Lord, we pray that you will, you will help us to mend those fractures that we have made with our, in our relationships with others. 
We pray, Lord, that our heart will be transformed, that they, the bombs that are buried there, the bombs of hate and anger and, and, and resentment will be removed by your spirit and replaced with a new heart, a heart that is pliable, a heart that is willing and desiring to follow you. Through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. And thank God for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because it was his sacrifice on the cross that gave us the hope of having any control over our lives as we give our control over to God. Let's sing about what Christ did for us on the cross by singing the song, By Christ Redeemed and Christ Restored. <clears throat> By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the memory adored and show the death of our dear Lord until he come. His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread, and so our feeble love is fed until he come. His fearful unknown agony, his life blood shed for us we see. The wine shall tell the mystery until he come. And thus that dark betrayal night with the last advent we unite by one bright chain of loving right until he come. Let us give thanks for the bread. <clears throat> Holy God, we thank you for this bread representing the body of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful, Father, for his love for us, that he was willing to give up heaven's glory, to become a human being, but to live a perfect life and to take that perfect life and offer it as the ultimate sacrifice for sin once and for all. Thank you, Lord. Help us to remember this and rejoice in the salvation we have through him and the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us partake of the cup. Holy God, for this cup representing the blood of Christ, we thank you. We praise you. Uh, we are really ecstatic in a sense, Lord, because our sins were forgiven. The sins that we could not, by legalistic means, take care of, you took care of by your grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. There on the cross, your grace and justice met in Jesus. And we, Lord, are the beneficiaries of that. We thank you for this. Help us to picture this blood that flowed from Calvary's mountain and how it still flows through us today if we will continue to walk in the light as you are in the light. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are able to come and join us this Sunday, uh, the 28th for worship, we encourage you to come. Our in-person service starts at 1130. We also continue to have our Zoom Bible study at 10 o'clock and uh, at 630 on Wednesdays. So if you're interested in any of those, please contact the church office. We'll be glad to send you an invitation and have you join us and our church family as we continue to meet together in the strange challenging, but still God-blessed times. And God bless you this day.